This is episode 194 of the Read to Lead podcast, and it's brought to you in part by cloud accounting software FreshBooks, offering you a free 30-day trial and access to all their features. Find out more at freshbooks.com slash read to lead and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. Whatever level we're at, we are the CEO of our lives. We better be self-aware. What do we have? What don't we have? Everyone has to be a continuous work in progress. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast with Jeff Brown. Jeff believes that if you desire to achieve true success in business and in life, then consistent and intentional reading is a must. The Read to Lead podcast will not only help you narrow this ever important reading list, but also bring you key insights and valuable feedback from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. And now, here's Jeff. Hello there, and welcome once again to the podcast dedicated to your personal and professional growth. We talk about leadership, and that's going to be the focus today, but we also dig into topics like personal growth and productivity, career, business, marketing, sales, and entrepreneurship. In just a few minutes, you and I will get to sit down with Kevin Cashman. He's the author of a book that first came out 20 years ago and is now in its third edition called Leadership from the Inside Out, Becoming a Leader for Life. I'll ask Kevin to share his advice for new and established leaders. We'll dig into the eight areas of mastery he lays out in the book, formerly seven areas of mastery. I'll ask about the changes in leadership challenges he's seen over the years and much, much more. If you're anything like me, you're you're taking some time over the holidays to think about your big, hairy, audacious goals for for 2018 and beyond. I know I've been doing some of that already, and we'll be doing some more of it in the coming days. And when I look back on goals I set way back when my business first started, one of those goals for my business was getting a better handle on the money coming in and going out. I also knew at that time I wanted a cloud accounting solution. And one of the first ones I began digging into was FreshBooks cloud accounting software. Started using it late 2009 and I've never looked back. I've been using it in my business ever since. And especially this time of the year when things are about to wrap up and I'm going to be thinking about taxes in the not too distant future. Boy, that whole process is so much less of a headache because I've been using FreshBooks all this time. You can find out more about their 30-day free trial and all that FreshBooks has to offer when you go to freshbooks.com slash read to lead. That's freshbooks.com slash read to lead. They've been a proud sponsor of the Read to Lead podcast for over a year and a half. And that's due in large part because FreshBooks is a service that I can vouch for and I truly believe in. Again, to try it out for yourself, that's freshbooks.com slash read to lead. And be sure to enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. Kevin Cashman is a best-selling author, a top 10 thought leader, world-class keynote speaker, global CEO coach, and pioneer of the grow the whole person to grow the whole leader approach to transformative leadership. Uh, Kevin has written six books, including The Pause Principle, Step Back to Lean Forward, a book recognized as a business book of the year finalist by both Forward Reviews and CEO Read. Uh, The book we'll be talking about today is itself an international bestseller and is now in its third edition since its original release nearly 20 years ago. That book is called Leadership from the Inside Out, Becoming a Leader for Life. Kevin, it's been a long time coming, but welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. Well, Jeff, it's my pleasure. I look forward to talking today. I started this thing four and a half years ago, and I'm thinking to myself, what took me so long getting you on the show? (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. What took you so long? (laughs) You've been doing this for a while. We have been. We have been. We've been um, really in the trenches of leadership for almost 40 years, so... We, we had a laboratory of development and assessment and leadership for 20 years and finally learned a, a few principles and then started writing about it. So happy to talk about it today. Well, what, what prompted all that? I mean, I guess you, you hinted at some of that, but what prompted you to write this book initially all those years ago? And then I guess the second part of that question, Kevin, is why a new edition now? Well, uh, going back 20 years ago, when you think about what was happening in leadership development, there was not a lot of personal development work going on. In fact, there wasn't research on self-awareness or emotional intelligence or 
any of the things that have become popular and important today. In fact, the best-selling books then were about quality and execution and speed and things along those lines. So what we saw was there was a big need mm. to really go on an inner journey to grow as a whole person, to grow as a whole leader. But we didn't just come up with it as an idea, as you know, I hinted at a, a few minutes ago. Uh, we, we had two laboratories. Uh, one was called the Chief Executive Institute, where we worked with CEOs and CEO successors, and another called the Executive to Leader Institute, where people would come to us from around the world, and then three or four of us as consultants and coaches would do a deep immersion with one executive over three days. And we did this for about 20 years. And we assessed these people, we coached, developed them, would have this three-day immersion looking at all these different uh, aspects of leadership, put a plan together, and then coach them for the following year. So after 20 years of that, we started to see patterns. We started to see what works, what doesn't work in terms of developing people from the inside out. And then eventually I decided to write the first edition. And what that edition did is actually took seven areas of mastery of how to grow as a whole person, to grow as a whole leader. Ten years later, wrote a second edition. Hmm. And then now, ten years subsequent to that, are, are writing the third edition. And the current third edition is 70% different than the first edition. Mm. And it's 40% different than the second edition. So I guess uh, the, the, the moral of this story is it takes me about 10 years to figure out um, a few new things and then, you know, have the impulse to write another edition of the book. Now, now correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't this book, when it first came out, one of the first to kind of make this connection between the internal personal growth with leadership development, where we often place uh, an external emphasis? Is, is that fair to say? Well, it's it's somewhat fair to say. It's nice nice for you to say it. Um, <laughs> there, um, there, there were a few of us writing about this inside out dynamic. Certainly, Covey um, mm -hmm. with his seven habits. You know, some of the habits were very focused on this dynamic. Uh, Warren Bennis wrote a real breakthrough book called "On Becoming a Leader." That you know, talked about uh, about this journey. So there were a few people. And also, if you go back through history, knowing ourselves and being aware of others and so on, all the great traditions have written about it. And these principles are, are kind of life and human principles, but they're becoming more and more important in our world today because of the pace of change and the complexity and and the need to to synthesize differences and, and, and be innovative today, it's a bigger challenge. So these enduring principles have always been around. I guess, you know, I was one of the first with Covey and um, Bennis and others to write about it, but they are enduring principles. And contemporary research, at least in human development, tends to eventually catch up with what are the enduring life principles, and then we eventually are able to do research and validate them. Well, as Kevin alluded a, mo a moment ago, he explores what are now um, eight areas of, of mastery uh, with a chapter dedicated to each one, and I'll just uh, mention them briefly. There's personal mastery, story mastery, purpose, interpersonal change, resilience, being, and what is now, I believe, called coaching that was uh, used to be referred to by something else. Is that right? Am I re remembering that correctly? Yeah, there's two new chapters in this edition. One is coaching mastery that in the previous edition was called action mastery. So in the previous editions, it, it was a call to action Basically, what have you learned and how are you going to apply this? And I felt in this edition, I wanted people to have more than that, to really understand how do you coach yourself or coach others to really be able to practice what's really important to accelerate our development. So that's a, a reframe in a new chapter. And then the other new chapter is 
as you mentioned, is story mastery, which uh, is totally original and a brand new chapter. Well, I want to get into story more in just a moment, but before I do, uh, what, if any of these areas of mastery, uh, would you say, Kevin, stands out as being one that maybe leaders seem to struggle with the most? Is there one that sort of rises above the rest? Well, it depends how you look at the, the question. I mean, uh, certainly leader to leader, there'll be differences, mm-hmm. right? And And the book can be a real development experience because you can see certain chapters might really resonate with you because maybe you're practicing them more and other ones are a little more challenging. So even going through the book will highlight, you know, what are the challenges or uh, opportunities for us as we go through it. So on an individual level, it'll be a little bit different. But when you step back, Certain chapters we see as maybe challenging to leadership, and other chapters are more challenging to life. (laughs) And the two chapters that are maybe the most challenging to leadership have to do with uh, personal mastery and also interpersonal mastery. And this is the basic emotional intelligence loop that Goldman and other people have really well researched. And emotional intelligence is just being able to be aware of ourselves, our strengths and challenges and so on. And then interpersonal mastery is being aware of others. And emotional intelligence is managing that loop. And all leadership is some interaction of the I and the we of leadership. And if the I is most authentic and open and real and values-based and principle-based, and it's really adding value to others, then leadership really gets catalyzed. So those two chapters, personal mastery and interpersonal, are, are fundamental to almost all challenges in leadership. But in life, a lot of leaders struggle the most with resilience, Mm. particularly the people we work with tend to be running organizations at the top, tend to have 24-7 global schedules, lots of jet lag and and, uh, family life and everything is happening at once. And to be able to maintain our energy, our resilience so that we can multiply energy in others because leadership is so much about activating strategy and products and services and everything that we want to achieve through human energy, we better have that energy and be able to multiply it. And that's the chapter that most people we work with say is the hardest one to practice in their life. Mm -hmm. So again, it's all individual, but the big picture, those, those three chapters are often the most challenging. Well, Kevin mentioned uh, Story Mastery a moment ago as being a brand new chapter in, in this edition. Kevin, we hear a lot these days about the importance of, of your brand's story. There's a lot of talk about the, the customer's story or the, the hero's journey, if you will. Um, how is Story Mastery, Kevin, different than what we might traditionally think of when we hear story? Typically, we've all experienced how impactful stories are mm-hmm. done properly and how Stories, we would say, are actually the the language of leadership that can inspire people to go beyond and to go for something really important. So Mm -hmm. they have that kind of catalytical impact on us that move our heads and our hearts to go for something important. And we've all seen great leaders, whether it's historically in our own life, use a story to really move us and, and, and move a group. So we've seen that. So what happens in most leadership development is, and there's tons of books on storytelling as a device or a tool of leadership, but storytelling is the outcome of story mastery. Mm. But a lot happens before we learn the mechanics to tell a story. So what story mastery does is takes us on a developmental journey around our story. And it begins with the journey to self-awareness. Do we really understand our story? What are the, you know, the tough losses that we've had and what have we learned from that or the 
difficult circumstances or difficult people or health crises or loss that comes into our life. And what have we extracted out of that? What's the great privilege and the great mentors and the, you know, the great, uh, you know, gifts that have come into our life and how has that impacted us? And so the book actually gives you an interactive tool where you can go into a website that we've designed and you can actually look at your life of all the highs and the lows, personal life, professional life, mentors, difficult people, health crises. And for most people, it's the first time they've seen their life as a whole. And when we see our life as a whole, we can step back and we go, what does this mean? What are the values that we know? What do we know about our gifts? Where do our gifts serve? When we lost that thing at some stage in our life, and now we feel that that value or that principle is precious, oh, now I know where that came from. So it's an amazing journey to, to, to know our story. So that's one level. The second level in the developmental journey to story is reframing our story. Because sometimes stories we tell ourselves about our life, maybe we had a difficult circumstance and we had to create a defense mechanism or some belief system to kind of get through that. And maybe that served us then, but it doesn't serve us anymore. Mm. And it may actually limit us. Maybe we don't trust people when we need to in leadership because of some of those old stories. So reframing stories and reframing our beliefs that no longer serve us, no longer add value, particularly in leadership roles, is the second part of it. The third level of story is to express the story, and that is learning how to tell a story that's both deeply authentic and deeply relevant to others, to bridge this I-we dynamic. And then the fourth aspect of the journey through story mastery is a bit surprising, and it's discover the plot. Because one thing we've learned behind closed doors, working with leaders over all these years, is that when you get really close to someone's story, it reads like a novel. Everyone's story is like a hero's journey. Everyone's when you get close to it. And there's just one problem, though. Our life reads like a novel, but we don't know what the plot is. So stepping back from our story and discovering, well, what's the plot? What's the gift that we've been honing over these years that really adds value to others? And we can get clear about that. We, we call that actually purpose mastery, but that can be the outcome of deeply understanding story mastery. So it takes it from storytelling to story comprehension that gives us authenticity, self-awareness, and real power in our voice and in our story. I like what uh, John C. Maxwell says in that regard about it, intentionality, that without it, we're, we're, we're kind of uh, living our story while letting somebody else do the writing for us. It's really, it's really interesting because the word authenticity is mm-hmm you know, comes from the root to author. Mm. And so real authenticity is writing and rewriting our story, (laughs) right? Mm. Consistent with who we are and also who we aspire to be. So that's the real journey of authenticity Mm. is is comprehending our story and, in a sense, rewriting it as well because it has to represent our growth, Mm. not just our past. Well, what about any trends you've seen, Kevin, in regard to the challenges that that leaders face uh, uh, with all the the CEOs you've had a chance to interview both for the original edition and and the more recent edition? Have the trends changed in regard to leadership challenges from then to now? It's changed a lot. And where we we see this from different vantage points, you know, I sold my business leader source to Corn Ferry 10 years ago. So now we have access to the world's largest database on executive assessment. Mm-hmm. So we can answer the question from an assessment and research basis, what's changing? And, you know, I can share that with you. But we've also seen when we look at the strategic changes in companies, strategies look very different now than they did 20 years ago. 20 years ago, much like the books that were out there, 
It was about efficiency, proficiency, uh, speed, mm. execution, and, and, and so on. Now, when you look at strategies, it's about digitization, innovation, globalization, and the complexity as a result of that is, is, is stunning. So the whole strategic context of leadership has changed. Mm. So that's one part. The other thing we see is that the need for leaders to be more self-aware has increased. We have research now that demonstrates that companies with leaders who are more self-aware, and we can measure that because of our database, and we can track companies over a three-year period to see financial performance. The companies that have the most self-aware leaders have the best financial performance. Mm -hmm. The leaders with the most lowest self-awareness and most blind spots have all sorts of issues in financial performance. So things like self-awareness, emotional intelligence are critical to performance now. We also have seen that learning agility now in today's world is the best predictor of potential and success. Years mm. ago, it used to be a raw IQ. Mm. Now, raw IQ is not as good a predictor of leadership and enterprise success as learning agility. How agile are we mentally with people, with results, mm. with change, with you know how we interact with other people? So in today's world, you know, the world really belongs to the most self-aware, to the most emotionally intelligent, and the most innovative and learning agile. Mm. So it's it's a very, very different world than twenty years ago. So the whole context of what's required has changed. Even though, this is the strange thing, even though I think some of the enduring principles of leadership go back thousands of years. So some of the enduring principles of courage and service and connection and so on go way, way back. The context that leadership operates in now is very different. Well, less of an emphasis on IQ is definitely a win for me. So that's that's the best news I've heard all week. <laughs> <laughs> We both have a shot now. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, a few episodes back, Kevin, I had the chance to interview a guy named Clay Scroggins. He's the author of a book called How to Lead When You're Not in Charge, uh, which I found to be a great book for new leaders. So I'm curious to know what advice would you give to new or, or aspiring you know, leaders to be? Well, to me, that frame, how to lead when you're not in charge, fits everybody from the chairman and CEO all the way to entry-level employees. Mm. Because to think we're in charge is a, in today's world with, you know, the context we just outlined with, you know, the digital world and the pace of change and so on, even being in charge is an old world model of leadership, a bit of a hierarchical, dominant, controlling model. Mm. Even that model doesn't hold up anymore. It's about agility. It's about fluidity. It's about being agile and, and being self-aware and connected. So even the model of being in charge is getting, getting obsolete. So I think it informs all of us at whatever level we're at. So whatever level we're at, we are the CEO of our lives. Uh, whether we like it or not, <laughs> whether we realize we are or not, we are. So being the CEO of our lives, we better be self-aware. What do we have? What don't we have? And based on what skills we don't have, what ones do we want to develop or not? Or what ones can we only be aware of and then rely on others? So everyone's got to work on their self-awareness. Everyone has to be a continuous work in progress. Uh, I've never seen a business that's, quote, done. I've never seen a product or service that's, you know, fully done. And it's the same for us. We're a work in progress. So mm. this continual um, dedication to what's next for us, what can we learn more, what can we become better at? So I think that's the other requirement. The third one, regardless of role, that is critical today is courage. We've done research across all five major industries, and we went in with the question, are there any competencies, and we've codified 38 research-based competencies that we know hold up around the world, 
And we were curious to go, are there any co- leadership competencies that hold up regardless of industry? And I would say regardless of level too. Mm. And there is one and it's courage. Courage is so foundational to leadership that without it, there cannot be leadership. The courage to do what's important, the courage to be authentic, the courage to go for what's next in our lives or in our leadership, the courage to go beyond what we thought was possible in a, in a relationship, the courage to continually develop. So it's just foundational. It's even more foundational than authenticity because you can't be authentic without first uh, being courageous and vulnerable. So mm. it's it's very, very fundamental. So I think those are some of the things that regardless if we think we have the illusion of being in charge <laughs> or not, regardless, um, those are the things I think we need to dedicate ourselves to. Mm, good advice. Uh, well, I have a, a couple of questions that I want to ask you that aren't directly related to the book, Kevin. Before I do, is there anything else from the book you want to make sure that we walk away with? Experience it. Don't don't listen to it and think it sounds interesting. Um, <laughs> get it and experience it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I can echo that. I, I certainly have enjoyed reading it and diving into it this last week myself, for sure. Uh, I'd love for you to think about, you've mentioned a few books along this journey, Kevin. I'd love for you to think about books you've read maybe over the last few years or so that have particularly stuck with you and, and had an impact on you. There's actually one that mm. for me has been one of the most transformative books I've read in a long time, and it's by Stephen Johnson. And Stephen Johnson is and a historian on the topic of innovation. Mm. So there aren't many people like him, right, that have, have studied the history of innovation. And he has a book called How We Got to Now. And he takes all of the big breakthroughs in innovation, like light and cold and glass and all these things that when you hear seem kind of mundane. But then he tells the whole history of how we came to some of these breakthroughs. And his conclusion that's overwhelming when you read this is that all innovation is collaboration, all of it. Mm. Meaning some great inventor somewhere along the line will be given credit for the breakthrough. But even that breakthrough has a whole history of hundreds, sometimes thousands of years of people working on something to get to that point. One one example he uses is he he asks, you know, the reader, well, who discovered the light bulb? And of course, we all say Edison. (laughs) And then he tells the story. Well, let me tell you the story of Edison. He went and bought 40, four zero patents on light bulbs that existed around the world. He bought them all up. And then he brought them back to the first GE labs, a group of people who worked in collaboration, and then took the best out of all of this and this collaboration on top of all these other people's collaboration. Mm -hmm. And to their credit, they synthesized the light bulb. And then Edison created that environment and was key in some of the final synthesis, but it was all collaboration. So the experience of this book is overwhelming because you go through it and then you realize, oh, this myth of the self-made person, it's a myth. Did I make the university I went to? Did I make the roads that brought me here today? (laughs) Did I create the healthcare system that saved my life at different points? No. And even in our profession, we're building on not only the history that's been there, but we're in collaboration doing it. So it's a real eye-opening experience to to go through it. So I would really, really recommend it. Mm. Another author I really like, and it'll sound a bit dark, <laughs> but he's a very entertaining writer. His name is John Ronson. And he wrote a book called The Psychopath Test, which <laughs> sounds horrible. It sounds <laughs> sounds dark. And it's one of the most fascinating books on leadership. And, you know, he does paint, you know, the downside of leadership, because as we talk about, leadership does change everything. But there's a problem. 
it changes everything for better or it changes everything for worse. Mm. So it's important to not just think of leadership as only progressive, although that's the direction we want it to go in and we help people you know, go in that direction. But it has a dark side too. It has leaders that are self-focused and narcissistic and self-absorbed, yet with you know certain skills or competencies that can take us places we don't want to go. And so I find this book really, it's really entertaining, believe it or not. It sounds so horrible. It's really entertaining. But it also um, takes a bit of our naivete away that um, you know not all leadership uh, takes us where we want to go. Well, Kevin, as someone who is as accomplished a, p- a public speaker as you are, I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to share a, a tip or two on delivering an impactful and, and memorable public talk. For those of us wanting to get better at that, what, what would you say? I would say emphasize stories. Mm. Stories, as I mentioned, are the language of leadership that can elevate people's heads and hearts to go beyond what they thought was possible. So it's great to have terrific principles, but what will move people and inspire people are authentic, relevant stories. An example of this, recently I observed two different CEOs rolling out their new values. Well, it turns out they were different companies, but the five values they were going to roll out were almost identical. One of the CEOs got up and, and in a deadpan, unemotional way in the front of a you know 3,000 people, just said, these values are really important. One, two, three, four, five. And the group is like stunned going, what are we wasting our time? Aren't these the same values as in the last soulless company I was with? What are we doing? And I'm sure, you know, if you could track LinkedIn profiles, I'm sure half of that auditorium (laughs) updated their LinkedIn that night. So it bombed, Mm. right? Mm. Even though the content was accurate, it was uninspiring. Well, the other CEO, a very similar size assembly, very similar values, you know, backed up by a PowerPoint, you know, the whole environment was very similar. But he's he got out in front of the group and said, let me tell you about value one and told a story of a health crisis with his son and how it impacted their family and what they learned from that, which was value one. You can imagine the whole group is on the edge of their chair, not only going, this makes sense to me and I have a story like that. And by the way, I believe this CEO and there's inspiration in the room. He did the same with all five values. Second one was about a career failure and what he learned and how he recovered. The third one was a story of a mentor who took a chance on him when he really didn't deserve it. But they took a chance and it it set the stage of his career. So you want a great speech that inspires, tell great stories. Mm. Well, finally, Kevin, let me ask, uh, what's what's next for you? What are you and your team working on now that, uh, as you look ahead, you're excited about anything at all you want to share? Well, we're working on, uh, we've had these different institutes, one for developing CEOs and successors, Chief Executive Institute. We have a C-suite development program called Executive to Leader Institute. We're just finalizing developing an offering called Life Plan Institute that helps people move on beyond corporate life to their next life to the next purpose-driven thing and and so on. So we're going to add that to our our suite of offerings to help people envision how is their purpose going to play out in the future when they don't have the executive role? How are relationships going to be engaged in new and different ways? Uh, How are they going to build their energy and vitality and resilience and health going into the maybe you know, last couple chapters of their life. So that that's one thing we're really developing and and excited about. But we're also excited to continue to take, 
you know, our offerings around the world. When I joined Corn Ferry, we were 10 million now. Consulting at Corn Ferry is about a billion. So mm. we have a lot going on across 140 offices. So the purpose drive of being able to take what we do have and touch the lives of key people and organizations who can touch the lives of lots of other people, that that's our main thing that really keeps us excited, how to catalyze leaders that can change the lives of lots of people is the main thing we're really up to. And everything else are, is just uh, detailed, different ways to make that happen. Well, this uh, international bestseller now in its third edition, as Kevin mentioned, w- uh, revised and with new chapters, is called uh, Leadership from the Inside Out, Becoming a Leader for Life. His name again, Kevin Cashman. Uh, delight to have you here, Kevin. Thank you so much for taking the time and, and sharing some of your insights. Uh, a lifetime of knowledge and expertise here. We appreciate it very much. Thank you so much, Jeff. I really appreciate it. The simplest way to dig into the resources and links that uh, Kevin and I talked about today is by going to the show notes page created just for this episode, and you'll find that at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 194 for episode 194. Give yourself the gift that costs absolutely nothing. Try FreshBooks cloud accounting software absolutely free for 30 days and make sure 2018 for your business gets off on the right foot. FreshBooks.com slash read to lead to find out more and enter read to lead in the how did you hear about us section. A quick editorial note, our next two episodes, both the last episode of 2017 and the first episode of 2018, will both center around setting goals and how to do so effectively and in a way that can truly change and impact your life. Looking forward to sharing those with you in the coming days. And I want to do all I can to help make 2018 for you your best year yet. Thanks for listening. I'm so glad you do. That's going to do it for this week. And I look forward to seeing you next time for the next episode of the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for listening to the Read to Lead podcast. As a subscriber, we challenge you to be more than just a passive listener. Become a vital member of the community. Visit us on the web at readtoleadpodcast.com. Until next time, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Oh, 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 oh,